All right, it's time to get into some actual probability rules. Um, if you are with someone else, you can totally play this game with a partner, um, but if you're by yourself, you're just going to play this against the computer. The game is called Odds and Evens. If you're with a partner, you have to decide. One of you has to be odds, one of you has to be evens. If you are by yourself, you're playing against the computer. Just pick if you're going to be odds or if you're going to be evens. What you're going to do is roll two dice, and if you don't have any, you can use this link to roll two virtual dice and multiply the numbers together. If the product is odd, the odd person wins. If the product is even, the even person wins. You are going to roll the dice 20 times and keep track of how many times each player wins. So pause the video and play 20 times, keep track of how many times each player won, and then answer question number one. Okay, so I just played it 20 times. The odd person only won six of those times. That is 30%. Now, if you're doing this as a class, your teacher might have you compile the entire class worth of data just to see if the odds were unlucky or if that happened across the board. Spoiler, it probably will happen across the board. <laughs> Let's figure out why the odds are so unlucky here. Um, what I want you to do is, first of all, in number three, you're going to write in all the products that are possible. So one times one gives you one, one times two gives you two. Just fill out this table so that we can see all the possible products. And then, answer questions four, five, and six. So pause the video, answer three, four, five, and six, and then hit play. Okay, so in number three, when we write out every possible outcome, this is called a sample space. A sample space just shows you all the possible outcomes for any event. So in our case, our event is the product of rolling two dice. It could be a variety of numbers between one and 30. For number four, it says use the table to find the probability of rolling an odd product. Well, I have them highlighted here. There were nine odd products out of 36 total. Hold on. I really shouldn't write stuff while I'm talking. So of the 36 outcomes, there were nine odds, which means the probability of rolling an odd product is nine out of 36, which happens to be 25%, which is why I'm willing to bet if you gather your entire class look at everybody's data, the odds probably lost most of the time. Now, if you were able to think through this really quickly, you might have had a slight advantage when you picked who was gonna be evens and who was gonna be odds. Most people would probably guess that half of the products would be even and half of the products would be odd because half of the numbers were even and half of the numbers were odd. But that doesn't actually work. An even times an even gives you an even, odd times an odd gives you an odd. Even times odd gives you even and odd times even Mm. gives you even. And this explains why 25% of the time an odd is going to win and 75% of the time the even is going to win. Now if you are doing this with a class, your classroom data is probably closer to 0.25 um, just because it's more trials, so it's going to be closer to the true probability. Okay, let's look at number six. The probability of getting a four or a five. Well, if we look at our table, there were three different ways to get a four. One, two, three out of 36, and there were only two ways to get a five. If we want the probability of getting four or five, we have to add those two together because there were one, two, three, four, five ways total that we could get a four or five. So the probability is five out of 36. Anytime you see a probability question asking about or, like the probability of getting this or that, what you're being asked to do is addition. The probability of this plus the probability of this. Now in this case, the events four and five, so getting a product of four or getting a product of five, those are called mutually exclusive because they cannot happen at once. When you find the product of those two dice, it is impossible for you to get both a four and a five in the same roll. So those are mutually exclusive events. Sometimes this is referred to as disjoint. To find a number besides six, you could count how many times a number other than six comes up, but that's going to take a while. It's easier to count how many sixes there are. There's only four sixes, which means there are 32 not sixes. So to find the probability of getting anything besides a six, you just do one minus the probability of six. This is called a complement. When you take an event and you say, I want to look at anything but that event, you're looking at its complement. So complement is basically the same word for not. And you do see it written as not something, but you might also see it written with a little C in like superscript. So, just, but they mean the same thing. And then last but not least, a number between one and 36. Well, all of these numbers are 
between 1 and 36. So the probability of this happening is 1, which is also just one of the basic rules of probability. The probability of the sample space is 1. All of your options, something's going to happen. These are the basic rules of probability. They're not things that you need to memorize because mostly we can think through them logically. Let's look at a few more examples just to see these rules in action. Try to do this first hockey example on your own. Pause the video and then hit play when you're ready to go over the answers. Disjoint is the other word for mutually exclusive. So in this case, the groups are disjoint. They are mutually exclusive because if I randomly select an NHL player, it is impossible for me to select someone who is both 17 to 21 and 30 to 35. One way to visualize this is if I did a Venn diagram. We have four categories. So here's maybe 35 plus. If I draw another circle for 30 to 35, that doesn't overlap. Oh, actually that should, should that be 34? The Venn diagram here would end up being four separate circles with no overlap, which means they are disjoint or mutually exclusive. The probability that someone is 30 years or older, we just have to add 0.26 and 0.07. 17 to 21 or 35 plus, we're adding 0.09 and 0.07. And not 17 to 21, we're just going to do 1 minus the probability that they are um, 17 to 21. So 1 minus 0.09. Now speaking of Venn diagrams, this next one specifically says to create a Venn diagram. So let's do that. Movie theater has studied customer buying habits. We've got the probability they buy popcorn, the probability they buy candy, and they do both. So here's our first example where the events are not mutually exclusive because it is possible that someone would get popcorn and candy. So the Venn diagram for this is going to have two overlapping circles. Okay, now when we're labeling this Venn diagram, I like to start in the overlap. They said there's a 12% chance that they do both. So I'm going to put 12% here. 12% chance that they fall into the popcorn and candy category. Now overall, there's a 56% chance that any customer is going to buy popcorn. So that means this entire circle has to represent 56%. If I write 56% here, now the entire circle is 68%, and that's not correct. So what I have to do is 56 minus 12, which is 44. 44. Yes, 44% chance that they buy popcorn, but not candy. Same idea over here. There's a 20% chance overall that they're buying candy. I want this entire circle to be 20%, which means this in here has to be 8%. Now, we can add those three up. That's only 64%, so we're missing something. If I do 100 minus 64, that's the percent that goes out here. These are the maniacs that go to a movie and don't eat anything. I've gone to a movie theater before, bought a bag of popcorn, and then left. I didn't see a movie. I just bought a bag of popcorn. Okay, so 36% of people aren't eating anything at the movie. Now that we've labeled this whole thing, it's going to be easier to answer this question. Find the probability that someone buys only candy. The section that is only candy is this piece of this circle. Because we did all the labeling of the Venn diagram, pretty much any question we're asked is just a matter of saying, oh, it's that part, it's that part, it's this part. So 8%. This is why I love Venn diagrams. Once I've labeled them, filling them in is like doing a Sudoku, except like it's a really easy Sudoku because you're just subtracting numbers. Um, and then once you have it filled in, any question they ask you is very simple. For this next example, there are two symbols you have to know. This like upside down U kind of N shape is intersection and it basically means and. The U means union and that essentially means or. So intersection is and, union is or. Pause the video now and even though it doesn't say it, draw a Venn diagram and label it for this next example and then try answering each of the three parts. So I started with the 12, the point 0.12, because that was the intersection of A and B, so that goes in the middle here. They told us that A overall has to be 0.62, so I took 0.62 minus 0.12 to get the 0.5. Overall B has to be 0.47. Yeah. Overall B has to be 0.47, so I did 0.47 minus 0.12 to get this number. All three of those added together 
there's something left over. So this represents the people who don't have a study hall and also did not drive to school. All right, now there's a little clarification in part A. This says probability of A union B, which is another way of saying A or B. Now the English language is kind of confusing because when you go to a restaurant and order an entree and they say, oh, would you like fries or chips? They mean one or the other. Do you want fries or do you want chips? You only get one, you can't have both. That's not really the kind of or that we're talking about in probability. When we say or, it's more like when you go to Starbucks and they say, would you like cream or sugar? You could have cream or you could have sugar or you could have both. They're not saying you have to have one or the other. So that's important to keep in mind. The or in statistics is like coffee, not like French fries. Hashtag new sentence. So anyway, this A or B, once again, is like asking, do you want cream or sugar? It could be A, it could be B, or it could be both. Now, when I say A or B, you might be tempted to just add 0.62 plus 0.47, because that's what was given in the problem, 0.62 and 0.47. Oh, A or B, she told me that or meant and, I'll just add them together. That gets you 1.09, which is not possible. That's over 100% probability that A or B happens. The reason that's happening is because we have an overlap with A and B. Because A and B are not mutually exclusive and this overlap exists, we can't simply, we cannot just add A and B together. Instead, we have to add them together and subtract the overlap. That way I'm not double counting the 0.12. So when I add them together, I get 1.09. I'm just gonna subtract 0.12 and I get 0.97. Now the nice thing about a Venn diagram is you don't have to do it that way. You could just do 0.5 plus 0.12 plus 0.35. And then there's nothing to mess up. In general, what we just saw is called the addition rule of probability. When you want the probability of A or B, you're doing the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B, which is the intersection. Here it is written in symbols. A union B is A plus B minus the intersection. So just a quick side note, um, back over here we did three plus two to get five and we didn't have to subtract anything. That's because four and five were mutually exclusive. So we could have subtracted the intersection, but the intersection was just zero, so there was really no point. I've taught statistics for six years and as a student who struggled with statistics uh, when I, before I was a teacher, um, I can't recommend Venn diagrams enough. Formulas are great, they can be really helpful, they can jog your memory, but you're going to make more mistakes when you try to force everything to be a formula. You'll make way fewer mistakes if you use visuals like a Venn diagram. At least in my experience, everybody's different. Okay, the probability of A complement. That basically means everything but A. So everything outside of the A circle is the 0.35 and the 0.03. That's 0.38. And not B would be the 0.5 and the 0.03. So that's 0.53. Love me some Venn diagram. Okay, the last example has three events. So you're going to have three circles that overlap. I would start by labeling the overlap of all three first and then work your way out. Pause the video and try that on your own. Okay, so I started with the middle, intersection of all three is 0.07, and then I just worked my way around. So like A and B, this leaf-shaped section, says it should be 0.19, so we just subtract the 0.07 to get the 0.12, did all of those. Then we look at A as a whole, a is supposed to be 0.48, so I did 0.48 minus this, minus this, minus this, to get 0.21. Then at the end, I added up all of these and got 0.85, that leaves 0.15. There's a 15% chance you don't get any job offers. Sorry. Okay, what is the probability that you're offered at least one job? The probability of being offered at least one job is the same as 1 minus the probability that you are offered none of the jobs. This comes up all the time in probability. At least one is the same as one minus none. That was really catchy. <laughs> so one minus 0.15, there's a 0.85 chance or 85% chance that you get at least one job offer, which is the same as adding up all of these numbers that are in the circles. Everything but no jobs. 
I've said it before, I'll say it again, everybody's brain is different. So you might think of a way to solve a problem that your friend doesn't think of, and that's totally fine. In general, I would say it's probably better to answer these questions using some kind of visual, like a table or a Venn diagram, as opposed to trying to memorize formulas. I just think in general, we usually have a better chance of answering the question correctly if we think through things logically, as opposed to just trying to fit numbers into formulas that we don't remember how to use. 